bees, butterflies and pollinating insects are dying out. This giant insect workforce pollinate our crops and if they disappear, most of our favourite foods will vanish too. It's a complex crisis, but poor nutrition is leaving our insect pollinators vulnerable to pesticides and parasites. I'm Sarah Raven and in this series I'm on a campaign to wake people up and show everyone the simple steps we can take to stop this quiet catastrophe. This week my campaign moves to our towns, our gardens and our flower displays. They may seem much smaller in scale, but combined they make up a massive network of green space, estimated at well over a million acres, and the potential to help our pollinators here is huge. The big culprits are some of our favourite bedding plants, like double begonias, busy lizzies and bedding geraniums, which we plant by the million each year in our gardens, our roundabouts and throughout our flower beds. They're colourful, cheap and easy fillers and may well be our favourites, but I doubt our insect pollinators would agree. These are all really good examples of plants that I wouldn't put into a garden if I was interested in supporting pollinators and providing food for those pollinators. All of them are so highly bred, there's no nectar, there's no pollen available, or if it is available, it's very, very difficult to access. With something like this plant here, which is a member of the daisy family, something which should have a fairly simple blossom containing lots and lots of individual flowers. And here, all of these individual flowers have turned into showy petals with little or no pollen available. To the gardener, they offer colour and impact, but to the pollinators, they don't offer anything. No food, no nectar, no pollen. But the plants we put in our gardens and flower displays are more important now than ever before, as over recent decades our countryside has changed so massively. We've lost 98% of our wildflower meadows and there's much less food and natural habitat for pollinators and wildlife in general. But our bees and pollinating insects are crucial as they fertilise many of our crops and without them, our favourite foods could disappear from the supermarket shelves. And so that's where our gardens and flower displays could become so vital. If we choose the right flowers, we could give our honeybees, butterflies and all the other pollinating insects the help they so desperately need. I was just wondering if you could give me the guidelines of how I can tell when I walk into a garden centre and there's tons and tons of plants to choose from, how do you know which are the things that are good for pollinators and the ones that are useless? There's some really simple pointers that we can give to gardeners. Great. The first thing is, first of all, look to see if the flower is single or double. Mm. Generally speaking, single flowers where you can see the pollen, the stamens in the centre of the flower, it's nice and open. Yeah. That tends to be better, it's more accessible for the nectar and the pollen for pollinating insects. The second principle is the flower shape. Try to get a range of flower shapes because they will all cater for different insects. Yeah. Out in front we've got these superb Achilles here. This is a very flat, open flower structure. It's also a composite flower. There's an awful lot of flowers making up that one head. Yes, yes, And because yes. it's open, short-tongued insects, things like hoverflies, can easily get on there and very easily get at the pollen and nectar. The last thing is to look at plants which have a succession of flower opening. The foxglove is a classic. We can see down the bottom here that there's some of the old flowers that have faded. Mm -hmm. There's a cluster in the centre of flowers which are open and ready and available. But we can also see if there's flowers still to come. These flowers will go on for weeks. Helen's three simple tips of a succession of flowers, a variety of flower shapes and single blooms are great to consider when putting any planting plan together for pollinators. In most people's gardens, when somebody is a plantaholic, they have a huge range of plants. By encouraging such a diversity, then you're going to encourage a lot of insects into the garden. 
the layering in the garden is really important because different layers are appealing to different kinds of insects. You will get different bees that are coming in at slightly higher heights, some of the hoverflies and the smaller insects like ants that will be lower down. And it's all about kind of creating a tapestry of layers that really weaves through the garden. Everything we've tried to do is to make a garden have a soul, and the soul really is the wildlife. The humble hoverfly is such an important pollinator and even though it looks wasp-like, it's completely harmless. Like all our pollinators, they need our help. We've got hundreds of species of these jewel-like insects in the UK, so if you want lots of them in your garden, plant lots of single flowers with bright yellow centres, as these are the ones they particularly love. Good morning, everybody. I'm Roger Williams, the Head of Science at the RHS, and thanks for turning out this morning for this launch of the RHS Perfect for Pollinators logo. The new logo will be used in nurseries and garden centres throughout the UK to draw attention to the best plants for pollinating insects. And if you can scan the specially developed labels with a smartphone, you're linked via the internet to a season-by-season -season list of insect-friendly plants. If we could, in every single garden centre throughout the country, have plants labelled really clearly as to which are useful for insects, then it could really help our insect populations, and particularly the pollinator insects. Guessing the RHS involved was something that I really wanted from the start. They've backed it in such a definite way, and the Horticultural Trade Association, and I feel really proud, actually. And it's very nice, look, uh, uh, releasing these butterflies at Chelsea. I've also been invited with Helen Bostock from the RHS to chat to Alan Titchmarsh about the label and logo on the TV coverage of Chelsea. If we look for this label, and I shall wear it now, and go around my garden centre looking for things with this on, just to remember that there's something in there, not only to feed our souls and our eyes, but to feed the insects as well. You're confident, Sarah, that we can make a difference? We really, as gardeners, can make a massive difference and can get Britain buzzing again. What we've done is embrace the, the sort of, if you like, the the philosophy of what you've been trying to, to work with us on, on um, trying to provide a more diverse environment within that town centre. You know, that's what we've done. We've, we've taken it forward from there. I'm not bothered whether the RHS like what we're doing. I'm not bothered whether the judges like what we're yes. doing. I'm yeah. more bothered yeah. whether the community like it yeah. Yeah. and whether we can make yeah. that difference. Yeah. It's the residents, it's the visitors, it it's Harrogate that we're, we're pleasing, not you know, yeah. people and elsewhere. And as you know, I was a bit sceptical when we started. I um, put my hand up to that, but we, we embraced it, we gave it a shot, and um, I think, I think the, the proof in, is in the pudding, if you like. We've, we've shown that we can do good bedding displays, we can show we can introduce good biodiverse area without losing the quality and the colour, and I'd invite any of the local authorities to come along and uh, see what we're doing, come and talk to us, but we're going to carry on, there's no two ways about it. That is so great. Patrick's new approach is to blend nectar-rich plants through the bedding displays on roundabouts and prominent areas throughout the town. Around 30% of the beds feature nectar and pollen-rich plants and clearly the change is being appreciated by all sorts of pollinating insects. But even bigger changes to Harrogate's traditional planting schemes are being introduced in the famous Valley Gardens starting with a project that Mary has set up to get more nectar-rich flowers in gardens across the town. This was a little project that um, I sort of dreamt up over the winter, um, really just to encourage people in Harrogate to put um, nectar-rich plants in their own back garden. So the idea was I sent away for a kilogram of this meadow mix seed, and decanted it all into these little individual bags, nearly 2,000 of them. Oh my God, packaged, that's incredible. Packaged them all up and we gave them out to local gardeners um, who then distributed them to their friends. And Patrick had kindly agreed to put a, you know, a, a sample of what they are here in the gardens. I thought it'd be quite nice to do a demonstration bed so people coming through could also see it. And yeah. then if we continue yeah. in future years, people yeah. will be going, we want some more of those, we want some of that. And so uh, an equivalent of this is in loads and loads of back gardens that's throughout right, the town. Yes. I'm really bowled over by the sheer amount of nectar and pollen-rich planting. Many areas now feature displays of pollinator-friendly herbaceous perennials, a clear change to what's gone before. 
Even the ultra-traditional Dahlia border is proudly supporting my campaign with the introduction of some single nectar-rich varieties. And if Caroline Bayliss has her way, it could mean a pollinator-friendly future for all of Harrogate's planting schemes. 18 months isn't very long to yeah, change what has probably been going on here for the last 50 years. And I think what we're doing is really, really exciting. And very luckily, because I happen to become the cabinet member for parks during the year. That, that is just so brilliant. I'll be able to see that through. It's sort of like we've got somebody on, in the campaign right in the centre. Like to think, thing. yes. This is an incredible result, as Caroline's new role as cabinet member for parks on the town council means that she can really influence the planting across the town. But the flower bed that could become a template for the future is one that Chelsea Flower Show designer Paul Harvey Brooks has designed for Harrogate. As beautiful as the bedding here might be, yep. it's not doing a lot for wildlife. Whereas our new beds, um, helped by a Chelsea designer, are alive, as you can see, and I think far more beautiful. I think it could be something to do with the colours. I don't know that I'm yes. a great bright softer orange colours. Much softer. But there is no arguing um, that there is very little insect activity on that. Whereas, I, you know, even from here I can see butterflies and bees absolutely yep. teeming. And because it's an interpretation board which will explain to the public why we're doing this, right. and hopefully they'll take those ideas home and put them in their own gardens, it looks pretty beautiful. Harrogate's new planting really deserves a pollinator-friendly gold medal. But for my campaign to be truly effective, I need bloom groups right across the country to take on board the same changes to their bedding schemes. And the RHS to really push the pollinator-friendly planting agenda right to the fore of the competition. So I've invited Sue Biggs, the Director General of the RHS, to Perch Hill to ask for her support. Do you think there's a chance that pollinator plants might be higher up the RHS agenda, the Britain in Bloom agenda, really, next year? We're absolutely completely behind everything that you're doing. It's really fantastic. As far as the judging next year is concerned, that's under review at the moment. This year's competition hasn't even finished yet, but it's already under review. And absolutely, now we've got this logo, now we're pushing this out, not only through all of the plant centres across the country, but also on our website. Everybody can have a look there at all the pollinator-friendly plants. And we would ask, as you would ask, that not only does everyone in the country plant more of these, but yes, we will be looking at the judging criteria next year for Britain in Bloom. I feel that... You know, you could be doing even more in that department at getting that message out. Yeah, and we will, and we'd love to invite you to come to National Gardening Week next year because there we will be announcing lots of exciting changes that really will make sure that everybody, yes, in bloom, but everybody throughout the country really does do more. Oh, really? So there's something that you've got up your sleeve for Yes, us. but I can't tell you till next April when it's National Gardening Week, and we'll tell you then. It's exciting talk from the RHS Director General and with Sue's support I'm confident that next year Britain in Bloom will be putting the needs of our pollinating insects right at the top of their agenda. The lessons I've learnt from experts along the way have also become a top priority in my very own pollinator oasis. The Nectar Garden has been such a great addition to Perch Hill. It's become a haven for us, but also a haven for the pollinators. And as I'm sitting here, it, there's just incredible, lovely, buzzing tones. And whenever you look around, every flower seems to be full with a honeybee or a hoverfly or a bumblebee. And it's coming to a real crescendo now with July and August in mind. Sitting amongst all these pollinating insects, it'd be easy to assume that there isn't a problem. But both nationally and globally, as their natural habitats decrease, every garden and flower bed really counts. I feel so incredibly encouraged and proud of what Harrogate have done. And it was just wonderful to see that a third of their bedding schemes now have nectar and pollen-rich plants within them. What I'm very excited by is that the RHS have absolutely got behind the idea of trying to get the word out through the horticultural trade to gardeners when you go into a garden centre as to what to buy that is good for nectar and pollen and what is not so good. 
I also feel really encouraged by meeting the Director General of the RHS. The Britain in Blue marking scheme needs to be looked at. It's good already, it's green already, but it could have even better benefits for pollinators. And I feel she's really got it. And that is an absolute triumph.